on C-Lab kicking off our virtual discovery week and we're asking educators we have two of us here all right so I'm Greg Graber I'm one of the educators here at the Dolphin Island C-Lab and I'm Rachel McDonald another one of the educators we have over here with Discovery Hall programs and so today we are coming to you uh, from one of our classrooms but we're talking about going down into the deep sea all right which is really hard for us to do when we really go to the deep sea, but we are chatting about this picture that we talk about a lot, but this is our home, of course. This is Mobile Bay, and what you'll notice is it's a really large habitat. It's about 30 miles tall and about 25 miles east to west, but it's super shallow. So for us to get to the deep sea, we have to work really hard and go out a very, very long way. So if you're wondering where we are coming to you from, we're coming to you from this point right here. But this whole area averages about the depth of a swimming pool, so about 10 feet or so. And so what we're talking about is how we explore the deep ocean in different ways and some of the cool things that might live not really around us here in Alabama, all right? so. If you're talking about the deep sea, obviously 10 feet is not very deep, but people go deep sea fishing all the time around here, and that's also not very deep either. So well, our fisheries lab that's tuned in on some of these kind of ask the scientist kind of things, when they go deep sea fishing, what are they fishing at? So Justin said some of their shallow ones are about 30 to 40 feet for in the artificial Alabama artificial reef zone. The deepest they've ever gone is a little over 300 feet, and that's really deep for them. It's around 60 to 80 feet, maybe on average, is deep sea fishing for Alabama. And that's amazing because the average depth of the world's oceans is dun, 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 about 14,000 feet, which is absolutely mind boggling, about 4,000 plus meters. And it is um, pretty amazing to think about it. And we always talk in terms of our tiny little island. So if you've been to Dolphin Island, it's kind of like from the sea lab to the water tower mm -hmm. is about the average depth of the ocean when we're down. And so that depth obviously causes lots and lots of issues of discovering things down that far. Right. So here we can kind of show you a quick, so this is our beautiful Gulf of Mexico. And if you notice, so we are over here to where, where Greg is pointing, so we're cut out of the picture. But what you can see here is this is a map. So we call this a bathymetric map, and then this is a map of the seafloor. So these colors indicate depth. And this is a really, really good new updated map. When was this one done, Greg? Do you what, remember? Five years ago, maybe? Five years Six. ago. So they are working on mapping and giving us a better re resolution of what our deep ocean looks like. Now I'm going to flip this over so you can see what we have had in the past and how much better some of our technology has gotten for us to study our deep ocean. So you can see the fuzziness of this, and this isn't old, we're not talking about 50 years ago, 40 years, we're talking about like 15 years ago, right, not long at all. 20 years ago in the 2000s, you can see the fuzziness but you can see now our ability to get these fine scale numbers. And I'll show you a different one because those numbers for us are the deep ocean for the Gulf of Mexico. But fun fact, the Gulf of Mexico never actually gets to the average depth of the ocean. Mm -mm. And so the Sigby Deep is the deepest point. I think maxes out like 11,000 or something feet. So. But this is when you start getting deep. And here at the Sea Lab, we get to do lots and lots of cool stuff periodically. And this is something that I got to do. And so here's a different bathymetric map. And you can see the color regime's the same, but this is about 15 years old. And you can also see how fuzzy it is. But this is kind of a neat thing that is completely different than anything we have here. This is actually the new Hawaiian island that is growing underneath called Luihi. And a couple of our educators here at the Sea Lab have done the science of the Navy. And we got a chance to map the brand new Hawaiian Island. And so this map is about 15 years old for me, and my wife did it two years previous to that. And so we have a couple of different versions of this, and we can watch that island grow when they do this. But what you'll notice again, like we were saying, is there's not a whole lot of really distinct peaks and valleys like there are in that Gulf of Mexico. And it's not really the depth, it's the technology at the time, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. So. Yeah. 
So that gives you a taste of what some of those underwater features might look like. And it's not just totally flat, right? You can see on this map, there were lots of nooks and crannies and they really use this in a lot of industry. So think about all of our oil and gas that we have in the Gulf of Mexico. So the groups that are helping to pay for some of this as well as our tax dollars are going to help better understand our deep ocean. So how do they make these maps? How do you have that? What's yeah. the process? Great question. So we don't have that technology with us, but they can hook it on to something like one of these now, or one of those. So these are remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, and these are some small ones. This one is one that used to be used by the fisheries lab, and they're actually out today with their newer one that's a little bit bigger than that one, but a square, more rectangular size. And they can put something on it called sonar. Now, if you're familiar, you could also have soundings previously where you would drop a line with a weight and see how far that depth would go. And it was somebody's job to pull that line mm -hmm. back up and count the numbers of knots on a rope that were a meter long a piece. Right. So how did we find out that the deepest point that people know is the Marianas Trench, but specifically a very deep spot in there is called the Challenger Deep. How did we know it was 11,000 plus meters deep? Poor, some poor soul, or at least a few poor souls, had to count a lot when Captain James Cook was out in the HMS Challenger about 150 years ago or so. Right, so sonar is a lot more advanced of the technology and that's what's giving us our resolution there. And to translate sonar for a lot of people, that's just your fish finder in your fish, in your bass boat mm -hmm. or something like that. If you're going out deep sea fishing, you're sending sound waves down, they're hitting a surface and they're bouncing back up and distance equals rate times time. And so you can get an idea of just how deep that area is. Um, and it was invented to find submarines back in the day. Um, and so that is kind of how we do it. And there are some really large fancy ships that go, like the one that I was on, that go and they call it mowing the grass. And basically they go one direction and then they go back the other direction and then they go back the other direction, sending down beams of sound that can bounce it back. Another way to translate sonar for people is a lot of people know how dolphins communicate around here. Yeah, and echolocation. Yeah, an echolocation. So when you're looking back at that Mobile Bay map, you can see a lot of white, uh, white stuff in there. And a lot of people say that's salt when you ask them, but really, you can't see the salt. That is sand and sediment. And you can see the dirt up at the top of the bay flowing out. And from satellites, you can see the massive plume of dirt that uh, comes out. And so a dolphin is able to use their sonar echolocation to pick out certain fish in a place they can't see their flipper in front of their face. And so we were watching them down on the West End this weekend from a condo and they were feeding, feeding, feeding. And then we saw them at the marsh about two weeks ago and they were inside of the airstrip feeding as well, using that ability to echolocate for sonar. Um, so, so we have a few labs at the Sea Lab that do use sonar. We mentioned yeah. the fisheries lab. No they go out, they have a sonar that I said could attach to their remotely operated vehicle and they use it to map the artificial reef zone off the coast of Alabama. So we have one of the largest in the U.S. and they are constantly going out and trying to update those maps. And they do that mowing the grass pattern that Greg talked about. We can do it on local oyster reefs and, as well and really shallow water. Uh, which is neat to see as well. And it's, I mean, for us, it's for safety. So when we pull nets between things, we have it mapped out where we hopefully don't get hung up because we know where structures are in our area. And, but again, it's shallow for us. And this technology has gotten so good that a few years ago, the one, uh, one of these ROVs from a really interesting ship, kind of the most technologically advanced ship. Yeah. I was at a conference and this ROV and the ship was side scan, as we call it, sonaring or multi-beam sonaring. And they came across what they thought was a new shipwreck. And the, it wasn't a shipwreck as they got closer with the underwater robot, like Rachel was showing you, but this is a big industrial one, the size of like a 15 passenger van. Mm -hmm. What they found out it was when they got closer and the lights lit it up was it was a bunch of washers and dryers from a container which they thought was a fuselage or the hull of a ship and all the parts were individual washers and dryers from the case that had exploded when it hit the bottom. 
And so they were mapping it, but they were finding all of these two, three feet tall things sticking out of the bottom of the deep ocean that they thought shouldn't have been there because it was flat in other places. So it does help with things like shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our former scientists actually got a chance to find several shipwrecks wow. in the Gulf of Mexico using okay. this technology. Yeah, cool. So let's chat now about some of the really neat specimens that we have behind us that are from deep ocean or for us from some of our bottom areas in the Gulf of Mexico that we consider deep. It's not fun we also find in some shallow waters, but they have some really neat identifying features. So where do you want to start, Greg? Um, we can start with these two worms because these were collected. We don't go to very deep spots. I mean, Rachel and I don't get to go out very much at all in deep water. Uh, just in our fish lab, they go out a little bit further and then periodically they'll send out something overnight. But for us, what we don't have here are these big industrial ROVs. However, a couple of times in the past, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab has had the opportunity with several of our um, professors to go out in some really interesting... So that is the Alvin, but I don't have the other one. Okay, so this is a picture of a submersible that is a submarine with humans in it. And this is kind of the world's most popular one right here. Mm -hmm. But about... 25 years ago, the Johnson Sea Link was in the Gulf of Mexico, and one of our uh, educators, uh, former educators, Jenny Cook, uh, was able to go out and collect some deep sea creatures. And again, we're talking about the Gulf of Mexico, so when we say deep sea for us, that's still shallow considering the rest of the ocean. And so we'll start with one of the cool finds that she was able to come back with, and one of the finds that kind of changed how we look at science but these are tube worms um, and if you look at some of these deep sea habitats the one that's probably more popular is what is called a hydrothermal vent well around here we generally don't have a whole lot of hydrothermal vents we kind of have their sister um, geological feature around here called methane seeps and so these are tube worms if you, these are the tubes the worms are in there somewhere you can see I think this there's side. A I don't know if you guys can see the worm. But the end of that these one. are what you see growing out of those black smokers, they call them, of the hydrothermal vents, this superheated water that is just billowing out of a place where the water should be really cold, about 36 degrees. But the fun part about these animals is that they're devoid of sunlight and they really kind of changed textbooks in the 70s because they don't rely on sunlight for a whole ecosystem of animals. And so that's changed the way we think about moons around Jupiter and Mars and that sort of stuff. So just because they're far away from the sun or other stars and photosynthesis doesn't mean that they might not have something alive. So this is one of the main ones. And generally when you see them in the black smokers, these are the ones that look like they have big red ruby lips that are sticking out of the tube. Yeah. Um, and then surrounding all of these things are cool things like little crabs and shrimp and yeah, and very, very active ecosystems, very unique ecosystems. In a place where we didn't think there would be any ecosystem to really hang out. Maybe the occasional next critter that we'll talk about crawling by on a video or something. You want to do this one? Yeah, well? and so this one was found with these samples mm -hmm. years ago. And this is one of those things that people don't even know exists a lot of the times. This is something called a basket star. And so when you ask students about a starfish, how many arms does a starfish have? They say five, mm -hmm. and they can really have a bunch of different arms. And this one kind of does have five arms if you look closely. The main branches. Where there. the main branches, and then it has all of these tendrils. Flip and what these over. do is they stick up out of the ground, and as they stick up out of the ground, they're what we call suspension feeders, and they're grabbing stuff out of the water. And when Jenny was out and collecting these tubes and collecting this, she couldn't see this. She could just see all of these hairs. And she was wondering why there was seagrass so deep, knowing that they weren't there, but she kept asking. And finally someone leaned over as she was talking back to the deck and was like, those are basket stars. Those are sea stars yeah. sticking their crazy, neat, long. So this one's dried out so we can't move it, but you can still get an idea of just how elaborate and how those arms, you could imagine them just waving it's and crazy. moving with any current or moving on their own, right, to try to collect. So is this the bottom of it? Yes, that's the mouth yeah, right so there. Yeah, so that's the mouth there. You can see so center. It's... I have him upside down, so this that's would be it. how you would probably often find him. 
on the bottom. Yep. I flipped it over to make him look a little bit more like the sea star that we're used to seeing. And then when she flips it back over, as they start catching food and food particles, they use these ambulacral grooves, big science word right there, but they use these grooves and they have the ability to move food down these lines. It looks like a zipper and that's kind of how it works. Yeah. And it moves it to the mouth where they will digest their stuff away. And so these guys can be found in shallower areas and their cousins we find really common in Mobile Bay in our mud systems that we've talked about. And those are called brittle stars, but we don't have any distinct basket stars mm -hmm. close to here and they hang out on the bottom, but you can find them the world over in different areas. Yeah. And so, about how deep do they live? It depends. Um, they, they can live from fairly shallow to thousands of feet. All right, and so for us, I think the Johnson Sea Link that we're talking about here uh, was in about 2,000 feet of water, from like 1,000 to 2,000 feet of water that they were occupying. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of things crawling by in that area that, that you can also locate is something weird like this. And this always freaks students yeah, out. We've got, a, we've got a few examples of this one, but you might recognize it from something you might find in your backyard. I'll give you a minute to think about that. What might you find curled up someplace damp, maybe under a log? Yeah. Greg's got a much, much larger version that was so big, it split to fit inside the jar. And when you tell <laughs> students about what these guys are related to, immediately they try to roll them up because these are cousins of roly-polies. And these are giant deep sea isopods. All right, again, and these occur the world over in deep sea habitats crawling all over the place. Supposedly they can go almost years without eating and not just one year, but like multiple years, they crawl across the floor and they look to find some dead stuff. And then of course, like their delicacy. Yeah, so those are their eyes. They have really large, dark eyes. And people always ask, well, if y'all don't go to the deep sea, how do you come across one of these? Well, these guys were brought in to us about 10 years ago. No, gosh, it's been longer than that. About 15 years ago from a royal red shrimper. So if anybody in the audience loves to eat Royal Reds, they're a deep water shrimp that tastes fantastic, but you got to go out well offshore. You stay out for, instead of a day or two at a time, you stay out for a month at a time and then you flash freeze them. But coming up with them is all kinds of really, really interesting areas that don't include where we generally occupy the zone. We call it the epipelagic zone. All right, so these guys would be underneath that. And the epipelagic, we call it, another name is the photic zone or the sunlit zone. And that's where we work all of our time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because why that's so important is about 90% of all of the ocean life, when you're talking about a habitat that averages 14,000 feet, 90% of that life occurs in the first two football fields or so. It's about 200 meters. Yeah, about 200 meters, 660 feet deep is where most of the life in the ocean lives. And of course, it's because of sunlight, but not just any sunlight, but the stuff that does photosynthesis. Correct. And that's really important because once you pass that, then you get this area that's just kind of blue light. And that's the next one. And that's the mesopelagic zone. And there's still sunlight, but a lot of people also know it as a twilight zone, not the TV show, but the, uh, but the different zones in, in the ocean, just under some of the green, yellows, oranges, and red colors. Oh, all right. Yeah. And so people ask, where do you find these? And the, and the answer is all over the place. One of our graduate students who was a fish scientist, he did his master's work in Puerto Rico. And he said they used to set out fish traps because most people don't know the second deepest place on planet Earth is actually just outside of the U.S. Ter territory of Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and it's 27,000 feet. And so when they would set these fish traps out at different depths, they would come back and they would have these giant isopods, luckily finding food, and they would have these huge distended bellies where they could barely move because they were so full of the food yeah. that they were trying to eat uh, fish. So interesting stuff. So basically this is a giant roly-poly that lives in the deep sea, looks for dead stuff, crawls around, and there are a couple of neat clips in some of like planet Earth and blue Search plants. for whale falls and you'll get to see the videos where there's nothing there or where they drop something in the deep ocean. Sometimes they'll drop fish or alligators depending on the research and these guys will all of a sudden just appear. 
And then they'll time lapse photography how these guys and some of the other deep sea yeah. creatures just like eat That's them, so cool. which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So, All right. one of the weird creatures that we have that is something that people don't think about and uh, and compares to what people kind of think about just because he's a cartoon and he's really popular is a different kind of sponge. So I'm going to grab a regular sponge while Rachel picks up the strange one because it doesn't look like a sponge. So this and one is a sponge, as Greg was mentioning, that just probably doesn't look like the sponge you're used to. This one's called a glass sponge. So you can see through it and you can also see it's enclosed which is really interesting. And so this is a deep water sponge made of stuff that's different. So the sponge that we think of, if you buy it at Bath and Body Works and you take a bath with it kind of thing, it's created by spongin, which is the soft, squishy stuff. These are actually hard sponges um, with a lot of little tiny shards of glass almost that are called spicules. But this one is made almost completely of the spicules. And so this is why it's called a glass sponge. It's made out of silica, basically. Yeah. And so they attach here down at the bottom, but they're really pretty and they're used as a Japanese um, wedding okay. gift. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think there are any in there, uh, but generally there are two shrimp that actually are encased in the uh, cage of the sponge. So interpret that as you will about <laughs> marriage, about but that is... Uh, yeah, but, a traditional wedding gift. But yeah, so, so these guys do live in... Uh, in deeper water, um, kind of devoid of sunlight a lot of the time. Um, but they are farmed and sold for traditional wedding gifts, kind of mm -hmm. like these are farmed, but really farmed for the bath market, basically, and we've been using them for thousands of years. So very different kinds of sponges, but they're all three sponges. But this this one, one lives deeper than those live. Yeah, much right. deeper. So these would be found on reefs somewhere. So this mm -hmm. is a finger sponge. And then this is a, I guess, a shriveled up bait sponge. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of sad looking at this point. It's kind of like falling over. But yeah, that is exactly what it is. And so these um, species are just very different, but this one is definitely a deep water, water version. Sponge. And you can see, obviously, it's colorless, right? So you wouldn't be able to see it well. And what is all of this down the, that's like in it? Is so that it the dirt? It kind of looks like roots where it's gripped on. So this yeah. is how it would have held itself onto the bottom. And so it has accumulated. There's different shells and that's other... It. It got dug out basically or yeah. scraped off. Other out particles of... pulling it out. Yep. So it's like pulling a weed out of the ground. You mm -hmm. kind of pull it. And you pull it. those roots out from underneath. That's kind of what you're seeing is probably looks similar to a root ball to you if you've pulled out plants in your garden. And it's really kind of cool. I don't think the people at home can see how intricate. really well, but it's so intricate yep. with the. I can try to. It's like it. a webbing almost of I like a, a crazy spider. I put a white background if that helps or makes it worse. Yeah, that makes it a little bit better. Maybe the blue might be even better to put like flip it around. Uh, it's just a, something that's a we'll different try color. The blue. That yeah. Help? So if you, that's really cool how they, it like weaves. Mm -hmm. It is exactly what it it's does. And so pattern. it seals up here at the top. It grows from the bottom up and then it seals up at the top. And uh, that's what traps in. But these shrimp live inside of this and then food filters through like all sponges filter feed and they suck uh, water in and they grab food particles and the shrimp eat food particles from inside of this. Mm -hmm. But they are trapped. They can't get, get out again, which is okay. interesting. So um, when you're looking at kind of deep sea specimens and things, one of the things that people think is that you live in the ocean and so fish live everywhere in the ocean. And the truth is, is that when you're talking about the deepest places, they do occupy like 97%, I think, of the ocean. But the deepest fish ever videotaped by one of these industrial ROVs we were talking about before, like these. Yeah. And this is one that went to the Marianas Trench. Yep, and this is the one that just recently went with James Cameron to the Marianas Trench. But the deepest fish videotaped is called a snailfish. And I think still the record is somewhere about 26,000 feet, 25 and a half thousand, something like that. And if you think back to the deepest point again, that Challenger Deep is 36,000 feet. So you still have 10,000 feet left in some of these super deep areas that, um, that fish don't actually inhabit, even though they can swim up and down and move around. But even they have to deal with pressure and it's hard to see and it's hard to find food in the biggest habitat because you have to go up and down and left and right and you can move up and down for miles. And so some of the fish that live in, quote, the deep sea, they do encounter deep water, but a lot of the times um, they're shallower than we think the deep sea. 
Um, and so some of those that are not easily caught by us with students like that come out with us are some really strange sharks that um, were caught by our shark research group and Dr. Marcus Dryman um, and the fisheries ecology lab years ago like this crazy gulper shark. And this particular shark people enjoy because it's a cousin um, and really closely related to what is called a cookie cutter shark. And so they get the fun, crazy mouth with those crazy teeth on such a small fish. But when the cookie cutter feeds, it sounds just like what it does. It makes a circle and it spins its mouth side to side and it takes just a circular plug out of the side of a squid, out of the side of a whale, out of the side of a bigger shark. So much so that we've seen circular scrapes of paint off the side of submarines when our diving subs are going down. And again, those diving subs and those nuclear subs, they really don't go down into the deep sea much. They go down a few thousand feet, and that's really the extent of it. Um, which is helpful because we were talking about underwater robots and that sort of thing, because the deepest human dive in the deep sea is only about 1,100 feet, and it's been that way, I think, for like almost 10 years now. It's really close, or maybe it's seven years. But that's with a specialized scuba breathing, different stuff than what we're breathing in, in our air right now. But to be able to go down into those depths, all of these underwater robotics and all of these subs are essential because to be able to see something like that, we just can't do it um, diving down. But these guys come in very rarely. They have gigantic eyeballs. So that tells you something. Obviously the eye is mostly closed, but you can see the size of the eye. And that is, of course, to gather as much light as it can. And so when you're talking about a thousand feet, what you have to do for us to get to those deep spots is we talked about the deep reds and oranges and yellows, but this is where we are. And that's why we don't ever see the deep sea is because we have this really broad continental shelf right here. And so to get something like this, we need to start going to the slope. We yeah, need to they start- love the slope, right where you get that transition. And yeah. Deeper. And for us to get, there, we don't have time with school students and that sort of thing in a day. The furthest I've ever been out with the Dolphin Island Sea Lab is 60 miles and we were at 200, I think, 20 feet. So it, had we gone another 10 or so, it would have gotten deep pretty fast because we would hit the slope. And that's where these couple of really cool sharks. Yeah, so this one is equally weird, but in a different way because most sharks have five gills. And this one is one of the rare ones we have that actually has seven gills. So there's a five, six gill. Six, seven. Yep, so there's a six gill and there's a seven gill. And there are a few different species of each, but all the rest of them have five. And that goes for stingrays and that goes for skates and all of their cousins. Most of them simply just have five. Mm -hmm. And so this one's deep water. That giant deep eyeball eye. is really impressive. And apparently when they pulled this up, it was like neon green. It was really, really, really cool bright green. See. It has crazy teeth it as well. It has crazy teeth too. And this is a major predator. These guys get very large and the six gills get really large and people always ask, well, what's the biggest fish, you know, the, what's the biggest shark they've ever caught? Mm -hmm. I think it was a blunt nose six gill is what they caught. It was coming up in the middle of the morning and it broke their 800 pound test line Ganyan, Ganyan, which is the fishing line, if you've ever put out a trot line for catfish, and it broke the line as it was right next to the boat. So they got to see the head, they got to see the mouth, which was massive and it fell down, but they think it was about 15 feet long, yeah. which is a very, very lar large fish. Any questions about the sharks, anything yet? Yeah, if anybody's got any yeah, questions. You said the bright green was the eye bright green? The yeah, eye the eyeball, bright green. Bright green. So, so was on that one. This one's a little bit different than other sharks. One of the fun things about this, yeah, <laughs> is like if you think about jaws, they had the big dorsal yeah. fin, but this one and the six gills and seven gills, they only have one dorsal fin rather than a uh, big one and a small one. And so this one actually has two really big dorsal fins. And so you can see the change in this one. So this one has two large dorsal fins and this, those small groups of the six and the seven gills, they only have one dorsal fin. So it's a little bit different, what we call morphology or body shape uh, for fish, which is kind of neat. But they patrol kind of the deep sea and then they'll come up into shallower areas during the night and they'll feed and there was some really cool footage um, a year or so ago of some of the six gills, I think, in the Mediterranean that are in the deep parts of the Mediterranean. And they come real close to shore where it rises and they'll feed at night and you can fish for them yeah. or something. We don't get them close to us at night because we have that continental shelf. So they would stay out on the slopes. So with the Mediterranean, the Pacific, um, 
they get the sharks and some of those other creatures, deep sea animals that are much closer to them than what we get. Right, exactly. So with those teeth, what it was interesting is they're kind of shaped a little bit differently. It looks like there's two different shapes to them. Totally. What do they typically eat? So fish, they're, they're still fish eaters even at that depth and very typical of sharks, despite having all those teeth, the top part of the jaw always has a distinct different look to the bottom of the teeth and it doesn't matter. The only one that's really about the same as a tiger shark, they have these very curved teeth, but um, even other sharks, if we were to grab a couple of jaws, you could see the top teeth and the bottom teeth. The bottom teeth look like um, kind of very sharp and pointy versus kind of steak knifey looking at the top a lot of the time. And so they are well, morphologically different for holding on to prey. And they're also curved backwards so that if a fish goes in and it's trying to wiggle, it just gets hooked on more to be able to get swallowed. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they're kind of backwards. But sharks and their cousins, those are all fish without bones. So sharks don't have bones. And a lot of people ask if that has anything to do with being able to live in the deep sea. Well, not necessarily, just because it's soft and squishy or something like that. But we do have a bunch of other weird fish and a relative of a shark. It's actually really uncommon for us to see. Turn on the sharks over? Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, good call. Let's do that. You can go there. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll switch. <laughs> um, and so here's one of those weird cousins of a shark right here. And this is called a chimera, a rat fish, a ghost. It goes by a bunch of different names, but it is really weird. And speaking of weird teeth, it gets the name the rat fish because its teeth look like that. And then it has that super skinny tail. And one of the things that is a common characteristic of fish, if you're going to tell kids, right? They have scales and they have gills and they have fins. Well, this one has fins, but it doesn't have any scales. And it's really soft and squishy and weird. As weird as it looks, it feels about that weird. But again, large eyes for the habitats that they have. And there was a really neat, was that a whale fall last year where a bunch of chimeras or two years ago that Okeanos had and these chimeras were swimming all around it hanging out. And so in the, in the deeper ocean, these guys are incredibly common for fish. Again, nothing's really common in the deep ocean because there's so large a habitat. But this is what people think of when they think of kind of deep sea fish and stuff that deep sea critters can do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, is because of Finding Nemo. And we'll, and we'll get it closer to you. We'll each up and then we'll grab yep. him later. And we'll grab him. But we all think of Nemo and the fish with the light bulb, right? That's what deep sea angler fish, stuff with lights that have really big gnarly teeth and that sort of thing. Well, these guys live in shallow water. So we can catch these, they're in our aquariums, but they also are fish that go fishing. And so that one is a little bit harder to see, mm -hmm. but it's got this weird black thing that in its nose. That one's much easier to see there. This one has an actual fishing lure, but it doesn't need to light up. Okay, yeah, let's do some contrast here. Here, I'll hold it like that. Let's do some contrast here, and maybe you can see that fishing lure. It looks like a black ball at the top, and really, it wiggles like a worm. And these both are fish walkers, mm -hmm. they're fin walkers. And so what look like feet, pretty much are feet. That's kind of how they do their thing. And these fins allow them to crawl along the bottom. And there is some crazy underwater ROV footage of oh, yeah. frogfish and batfish, and batfish that was their frog. frogfish crawling around. Uh, there's a version of this guy called a sea pig that looks like a pig and it waddles around like a pig, but they all have the ability to lure prey in like those other fish with the light bulbs. Mary Ann says, these were the stuff of my nightmares when I was a <laughs> yeah. youngster. Oh right. no, yeah, this yeah. one's lure would have been right underneath where you would consider his nose there. It's kind of pushed yeah, up against it's it. Pushed it's pushed really up against small. it. But he would wiggle that one too like a small worm. Just kind of hide out right there and wait for something to swim by. And, and over at the estuarium across the street, we have a couple of these. We have some of these. And if you watch them, They'll shoot this thing they'll right out of their nose it. and they'll yeah. wiggle it around. There's nothing in the tank that they're really going to eat. And ours are what color? Yellow over there? Yellow and orange? Yellow and orange. So these have lost their color. So they're not always this dark. But and some of them look like just a rock. Yeah. In the deep ocean. So they would still be camouflaged. But they are much prettier to see in an aquarium than the ones we're holding. But those don't like to be held over there. So. And some are called ruby red, uh, red lip really backfish. Lips. And they have these like bright, bright, bright red mm -hmm. lips. Um, we posted that for our uh, Valentine's Facebook post <laughs> at, at the Sea Lab. But yeah, so again, angler fishes, but they don't have to live in the deep sea, but this is the closest thing that's easy for us to show you 
fish that go fishing. Yes. We have a question from Treasure. She wants to know, or he wants to know, would they fall under the subclass of teleos? Or what subclass? Teleos. Oh, teleos. So teleos are bony fishes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so these are yeah. bony fish. Yeah, Correct. teleos. So these are not like the sharks and the chimera. These are bony fishes. Good question. So, yeah, excellent fit. So question. now we've got an awesome one that Greg's going to show you the lure on this one. And if you Google goosefish or monkfish feeding, you can actually watch this. There's a bunch of really cool videos, but here is their fishing lure right here. And there's a really great old school video of this from like a thousand feet down and it is wiggling it just like shaking a pom pom. And you watch it for about 10 seconds and this fish swims right in front of it and you can see its gnarly mouth. These are just a beautiful fish, right? One that everybody wants to catch and cuddle with. And fun fact, you've probably eaten it. Um, if you are a fish eater, if you ever see monkfish on a menu, this is a monkfish. Yes, and they will never show you its picture. Right, because nobody wants to eat something that looks that ugly. But yes, major nice predator. Now. There's They're the fins again. Look at his itty bitty walking fin. So you can tell he is not here to move. He is a nice pink head. That's right. It sits on the bottom and it literally does nothing except wiggles this around because it doesn't have to do anything. Fish mm -hmm. think it's food. If you're a filter feeder um, or whatever, this guy's just, God, he's strong. Ooh, he's strong. Um, and so <laughs> he smells, he, sorry. He, he smells not dead. He smells <laughs> like uh, preservative. But anyway, that fishing lure is just really impressive and they just mm -hmm. dangle it right in front of their mouth. And his eyes, you can see his eyes are a little bit larger too, which normally indicates again that he's in an environment with low visibility or no visibility. And That's he right. would be trying to see other animals that create their own light, things that make their own bioluminescence like you do saw. They, do they have, so we've talked about some of the larger eyeballs. Do they the, have the, the membranes, the membranes over the top. that cover it? These guys do not. And those sharks, about the chimeras. yeah, I don't think the sharks do, and generally fit uh, bony fishes. I don't know of any. Do you know of any bony fish that have a? Not I love my head, but that's a good question. But we can find that out. Up and ask. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so this is, um, and it's got whiskers, so it can also he's, feel stuff like a cat. He's adorable, right? Yeah. There's so many cute features to talk about on yeah, this one. So, he's, he's much cuter than you think. Yeah, right. He is, and he's <laughs> he's smooth. So again, we've got scaleless here. Yep. And they like to wedge in the rocks and hang out in mud and stuff so they don't peel them, peel their scales off. Or anything. Are they related to the frogfish that we have in the aquarium? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, this is a frogfish, frog so yep. kind of because they all have the ability to angle, to be anglerfish, to be able to catch their own food, yeah. to attract their own food. But goosefish and monkfish, I think, are in their own specific groups. How close would this be to the toadfish, or again, just toadfish? That's what I was saying. Oh, toadfish. toadfish! Probably closer to a toadfish. Mm -hmm. Probably closer to a toadfish, and so uh, pretty interesting. But these are some of those um, deep sea critters that we encounter when we go down into the deep ocean. All right, and so whether we can catch them or not, all of these kind of have the abilities that some of those other fishes and other life do. And um, it's always fun because when people bring us weird stuff, we love and, it. <laughs> yeah, every couple of years. I mean, again, that's how we got the monkfish. That's how we got the. Um, uh, that's how we got another. There's a smaller yeah. monkfish. It's got a little bit different pattern. You can see he's got a little bit more coloration left on him. You can just barely see the lure on the top of his head. This was one that one of our educators was out on one of the NOAA Teacher at Sea programs and was able to collect. As a part of that program. Super cool. Rissa, by the way, says hello. Hello, Rissa. Great to hear from you guys. Yes. So, um, but yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, throw them in the comments and Rachel and I can check them out later. Or if you have any questions now, feel free to ask. We'd love to, uh, to be able to give you some in information about some of the things that we're talking about. And while we're waiting, unless there's any questions, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some other events we've got going on for our Discovery Week with the Dauphin Island Sea Lab as we celebrate 50 years. So this morning we started off with a salt marsh excursion, but there's other excursions if you'd like to come bring the family and do yeah. an excursion. So we've got one tomorrow out on the beach. Weather's going to be great, so it'll be fun for the whole family. On Thursday we've got two different activities. We've got a salt marsh in the morning. And then we've got a kayaking that Greg and I will be doing Thursday <laughs> afternoon. So if you want to come kayak with us, we'd love to take you out into the salt marsh and some great areas to check out 
the birds, the plants, the animals that we'll see, and we'll see all of those things. Yep. And then lastly, on Saturday, there's also a boat trip. So if you want to get out on one of our research vessels and get a chance to go out and maybe collect, maybe not these guys, but some other really cool right. animals, yeah. uh, you can have a chance to do that on Saturday afternoon. So We do have one question, which um, I'm not sure if they're talking about high school or younger kids, but it says, well, this will students get to study these species this summer, but y'all are always around to answer questions. Correct. We are. Exactly. So whether it's uh, summer camp programs or the school groups that are finally starting to pick up uh, mm -hmm. uh, with COVID and that sort of thing. I mean, we're around. We're also Googleable. Uh, so so if you're at the CLA website, our our email addresses are available, so if you have questions uh, about that sort of thing, feel free. But yes, we definitely offer our slew of summer camps this summer. I think most of them are pretty close to full. They are starting to fill up, so if you are interested, check out the website soon for summer camps. Our high school program, I know the deadline for that just passed, but if you're still really interested, let us know. Yep. We are doing virtual classes right now, so some of the specimens we pulled out today, we've been getting a chance to show off in our deep ocean um, zone uh, virtual class. So we are still doing the school groups right now as well. So you can still come. We've got some Friday programs and some Saturday programs as well that we're leading that you can bring the whole family to. Correct. And so we appreciate you tuning in today. And again, we've got stuff all week. 50 year anniversary for the Dolphin Island Sea Lab this year. And uh, thanks for tuning in on our virtual mm -hmm. discovery week. We're so excited to have you. See you guys soon. Take care. Bye.